Hello everyone, my name is Reed and welcome to Storytime. Today we are going to be reading some malicious compliance, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. You want me to roll burritos? Lose your bonus check. The backstory. I work at a corporate McDonald's in Michigan, and I won't get into too much detail because it will definitely give away where I live. The most important part of this backstory is that it is a corporate store and it is infinitely harder to get rid of a problem manager because they have company protection. This means that issues keep getting brought up with no resolution, and we lose employees as a result. Our store fluctuates heavily between being overstaffed and being so understaffed that we can't function. Most of the reasons for quitting at my store are the result of one manager. The manager in question, let's call her Jane, pretty regularly won't let employees clock in if they've had an altercation on Jane's last shift. Jane is a department manager, in charge of the kitchen with two other department managers taking over guest service and people management. Now, a fellow crew member, Terry, had recently changed her schedule because of class and was mistakenly scheduled for four shifts outside of her new availability. No problem, right? Wrong. All four of these wrongly scheduled shifts were Jane's shifts. They had a three hour long fight about clocking in on Terry's fifth shift for the week because our scheduling manager and general manager both weren't answering their phones. Terry and I both cross trained in grill and in service, and most of the time I am stuck back in the grill with maybe two or three more people, and Terry being scheduled outside her availability did screw me, but I didn't blame Terry for leaving me a man down. It is safe to say that these two hate each other very much. Malicious Compliance Something to understand about McDonald's in the US is that most of the stores don't roll their own breakfast burritos. We are given the sausage pepper egg mix, tortillas, and cheese. We place the tortilla on a wrap, place one slice of the cheese, torn in half, on the tortilla, use a 3 ounce scoop to put the mix on the cheese, pile the mix in a line, and roll the burrito. Then roll the burrito into a wrap. Get the process? Good. This is something that the afternoon shifts are supposed to be doing to fill 7-ish large trays for the next morning. No big deal, until they don't get done. A few shifts after the clocking in debacle, maybe a week or two later, the concept of time passing is a real struggle for me, Terry and I are working in the grill together. We run out of burritos and find out when Terry goes to roll them that we are out of the mix and that we just weren't told that because communication across even two shifts breaks down pretty fast. No problem, right? Well, Jane thought Terry was just being lazy and didn't want to roll any burritos and told her such. And then to, Stop being so dang lazy and just do what I tell you. Now, go roll burritos. So, Terry did. Without the mix. It took probably only 40 cheese burritos handed out to customers and four phone calls before Jane realized that she made a mistake. Terry had made about 140 or so, seven whole trays worth. Terry knew what she was doing wasn't going to end well, but she was told to roll burritos, so she did. If anyone has worked fast food, you'll know about something called food cost. It is how much waste food is produced on one shift and has a significant impact on if a manager is considered for promotions and raises and is a factor in overall effectiveness as a manager. Jane is responsible for not only all of the waste from this shift, but as the department manager for the kitchen, also overall store waste. 140 tortillas is a lot of waste for one shift to produce, as is three-fourths of a block of cheese. What we didn't know at the time is that it was the last day of accounting for food costs to receive a bonus check. That little spike of extra food waste lost us our bonus check. It lost us the extra money for the store, aside from the bonus check, for things like renovations, uniforms, whatever corporate deems it budgeted for at the time of disbursement, that corporate will give us for meeting certain criteria like food costs. Amazingly, Terry didn't get sent home and we all got to watch the fallout. Jane is currently on probation because of this mistake, and if something else major happens, she could lose her job. She also isn't allowed to run any shifts on her own during probation because another manager has to be there if something else happens. I have since left for college, but I'm sure that Jane isn't going to be there when I get back. It's hard to change 8 years of anger in one day. 
All because she didn't believe Terry that we really didn't have the burrito mix. Hmm, interesting. Burrito mix. Okay, I think I'll stick to my egg and cheese biscuit. I guess Jane learned a valuable lesson about not being lazy. Illegal to cut down trees? Fine, I won't cut them down. My town had some pretty strict bylaws about cutting down trees within town limits. It's because we're part of a green belt or something meaning we have to maintain a certain amount of green space on our properties. So, for example, you can't just pave over your entire front lawn for extra parking spaces and any existing trees on the property must be left alone unless removal is absolutely necessary for construction purposes or safety concerns. Normally this isn't an issue, because we're a fairly rural town, the lots are pretty big and having all the tree cover gives you a lot more privacy. Where this became a problem was in 2016 when a massive ice storm hit that knocked out power for three or four days. It also severely damaged a large tree on the front lawn of a 25 acre lot just on the edge of town. The man who owned the lot was a retired farmer, about 80 years old, who was a well-known figure in the community. He had built the house pretty far back off the road on his property and right next to a massive tree, the same one that was now damaged by the ice storm. Spring came and the tree died and looked like it was now in danger of falling on the house. He had a local tree service come out to inspect it and they confirmed that if something wasn't done, that the dead tree could fall down, possibly towards the house, since there was a large split forming in the trunk as a result of the ice storm damage. The tree service couldn't do anything without the man getting permission from the town first, since the tree would need to come down. Trimming would have been fine, but not cutting it down. To make it more infuriating, a neighbor literally next door was outside of the town limits and therefore was free to clean up the storm damage however he saw fit. The man went and applied for a permit to have the tree service come out and cut down the tree and provide them with a quote from the tree service stating that it was a hazard. For whatever reason, the permit was denied by the town with no real reason given. With a nasty thunderstorm in the forecast, which he feared might send the tree crashing down on his house, and the town not giving him permission to do anything about it, he decided to take matters into his own hands and got a hold of a copy of the town's bylaws regarding this situation to see if there was a loophole somewhere. And oh boy was there a loophole. The town made a pretty serious mistake in writing their bylaws. Have you ever noticed how laws are always written in a really strange, overcomplicated way? Well, this is done on purpose to try and minimize any creative misinterpretations of the law. Our town, however, had written some of its bylaws in more or less plain English saying that it was illegal to cut down trees without approval from the town. Note the word cut in that sentence. This is important. After a quick phone call to his attorney, this man somehow got a hold of a Caterpillar D7R which is a big freaking bulldozer, for those of you who don't know, probably borrowed it from the local gravel pit or something since he had that kind of pool in town. Anyways, the next day when the bylaw officer, knowing full well that his permit had been denied, caught him cutting up the already fallen tree he stopped to investigate. The man calmly explained that he had been using the bulldozer, which was still sitting on the front lawn, to tear up a section of dead grass so he could reseed it when he had accidentally bumped into the tree with the blade causing it to fall over away from the house in the opposite direction from where it had been leaning. Obviously, the town saw right through the cover story and knew full well that he had knocked the tree over with the bulldozer on purpose and slapped him with a fine for it. He took it to court and won as the town's bylaw stated that cutting down trees without a permit was illegal but it said nothing about pushing them over with a heavy earth moving equipment. The bylaw was changed and has since been repealed entirely and you're pretty much allowed to do whatever you want with your property as long as it maintains the green space requirements. Something I've been noticing more and more is that when you're over a certain age, you really don't give a crap about what people think or say or tell you to do. I'm sure at 80 years old, this man was like, you know what, I'm going to do it, and what's the worst they can do about it? I'm glad he went about it in a smart way and, you know, found the loophole in the bylaws and everything worked out for him. If you aren't going to be here on time, don't bother coming back. 
At the time of this story, it was the summer between my third and fourth years attending a state university's business school. I had been working in various bars, restaurants, and nightclubs throughout my time at college to cover the expenses my scholarships didn't cover. I had, at this point in time, done almost every job in those types of establishments and was constantly trying to expand that, because my intended career path, which I did not end up in that career at all, was in the industry and I wanted to know every aspect of it. This story is about what happened when I left a prior employer who said they weren't going to train me on bar because they had no need for more bartenders. It was the next position to learn for me and took my first bartending position. I got hired to bartend at this steakhouse restaurant. It was a pretty slow place. I get hired just after the spring semester ended. I had signed up to take a summer class though, and I let the manager know that when I applied for the job. I let the manager know what date the summer class was going to start and gave him a copy of my class schedule along with an updated sheet with my availability three weeks in advance. I reminded him of it again the next week and he said he needed a copy of my class schedule or my updated availability, so I provided him with another copy. Same thing the next week before classes started. The schedule went up for the week, wouldn't you know it, I'm working every single time I have class that week. I go to the manager, I remind him what we had discussed and that he needs to find someone else to cover those shifts. He says I should have provided him with a copy of my class schedule or written notice of the change in my availability. I remind him that I did so three times in the weeks leading up to this, and I reiterate that he needs to find someone else to work those shifts. He tells me that's not going to happen and I need to be there to cover those shifts. I tell him the best I can do is to come by after class and work after class is over, which will mean there will be two hours when either the manager on duty will have to cover the bar, the day shift bartender will have to stay late, or there will be no bartender. Manager does not like this. He tells me I need to be more responsible. I respond and tell him that I am being responsible. I'm putting my education and future above a single bartending job that I've only had for a few weeks, and that I'm not going to sacrifice my education and further because he doesn't want to deal with the change in my availability that he knew would be coming when he hired me. I make it clear that my education is my first priority and that if he wishes to see a demonstration of whether or not his need to have someone cover the shift is higher on my priority list than my education, then he can leave me on the schedule as it is. Boss responds and says, that's insubordination, and tells me that if I'm not going to be there on time, don't bother showing up at all. So, I don't. I don't bother showing up for any more shifts after that day, even on the days before classes started. I got an angry phone call, of course, and just said that I decided to do exactly as I was told. Since I already knew I wasn't going to show up on time for those shifts, I just wouldn't bother to show up at all anymore. The restaurant was closed less than six months after that. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that poor management played a substantial part in its failure. I actually had a similar situation to this whenever I was in high school. I worked at this video arcade. I had this event that was coming up and I had family members from out of town going to see it. I made it clear that I needed this day off and I usually had that day off. Well, my manager decides to put me on that shift. I talk with some other co-workers. They say, okay, we can trade shifts. We go to the manager and say, hey, can we trade shifts? I have family coming out of town, coming to this event specifically for me. Manager says, no, some people switched shifts last week. I'm tired of it. You guys are gonna work what's on the schedule. I told him, okay, I'm not gonna be there. He didn't believe me. I didn't show up for that shift. And I got a really angry call about it. And then I also was fired. <laughs> oh well. You want bright? You want color? Okay. When I was in high school, I was pretty angsty and not much into fashion. As a result, I had a wardrobe that basically only had black, gray, and navy. Despite being the people that bought me those clothes, my parents were annoyed. You should wear color. Why won't you wear more color? Your clothes are too dark. You should wear something brighter. When I was a senior, I got my own job and could buy some of my own clothes. My favorite place to shop was Goodwill. 
One day, I found a pair of ugly convict orange corduroy pants that fit me like a glove. I decided to buy them. From there, I kept acquiring more and more ugly convict orange clothing items. Items that range from neon to hurts your eyes to look at them bright. All in convict orange. I also wore them constantly. During the next few months, I had lots of people, relatives, church members, etc., ask me why I was wearing clothing that was an affront to the eyes. I gladly told them that my parents were tired of my dark clothes and wanted me to wear something brighter and more colorful. It's been 10 years and no one complains about my clothing choices anymore. I definitely want to see OP in some of these convict orange monstrosities. They sound absolutely intriguing. Well, that's all we have for today. If you liked what you heard, subscribe for more content like this daily. Go out on your merry way and have an amazing day.